It's been three years since we last talked to this guy, believe it or not. Shame on us. Uh, he is the radio voice of Penn State Nittany Lions football, among other things. Steve Jones, we say, welcome back, Steve. Hey, Bill, check. Great to be with both of you again. Finally, bring hey, the team back together. I know you've been counting the days. I know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, let's get the bad out of the way, first of all. Last season, after that 5-0 and start, the Nittany Lions lost six of their final eight games to finish 7-6. and six. I know there were a couple of injuries along the way, but every team has injuries. What else went wrong last year? Well, I think that's a big part of it because you'll see with the top teams in the country, and when Penn State won 42 games over four years and with the three New Year's Six Bowl games, they had the depth to absorb a problem here or there. They didn't really seem to have the depth last year to absorb a problem. Even Alabama, they'll get injuries, as you mentioned correctly, but they had the depth to absorb whatever problem they have. This year with the recruiting class they brought in, it has changed the depth quotient back to where it was. And I think that is a big difference because it's just the nature of the game. 12 games, 13 weeks, you're going to get, everybody's going to get somebody banged up. It's whether you can absorb it or not. And to the credit of the top teams, they've been able to. Penn State in that four-year span could do it. Last year, they could not. Well, Steve, to, to follow up on that just a little bit, uh, there were, were multiple injuries, but none any more important than Sean Clifford. Uh, sure. I thought Sean was playing pretty good ball for them in the early part of the season. But when he went down, like you say, there was no replacement. And it, it made the whole thing kind of fall apart. Yeah, that was big because you look at what Sean did in 19. They was started out 8-0 eight and, all, eight and, all, and then he got hurt. Last year, they started out 5-0, and oh, big win over Auburn. And then they're up 17 to three on Iowa at Iowa. And I mean, they are in control. And then of course he exits because he's hurt. And suddenly they don't have the control they had before. And then they really started the spiral. And he really kind of fought his way through the rest of the season because look, he's a gutsy guy, he's a team guy, but look, he wasn't 100% uh, after that. And it, it made a big difference. And for anybody out there saying, well, they should have had a backup ready. There was nobody in the planet who transfers in saying, I want to be the backup. Everybody <laughs> transfers. They want to be the starter because there's one position. And that's why I give the Charlie Brewer example. He's not going to start anymore at Baylor, so he goes to Utah. He starts. He starts three games. Then he's not starting anymore. He transfers. Now he's the starter at Liberty. <laughs> Quarterbacks want to start, and that's why it's really difficult to get guys to transfer in with the idea they're going to be the backup quarterback. So – it just didn't work out. Bayer wasn't ready. Roberson struggled. John Clifford now 24, so he certainly got the experience, and we're looking for some big well, things from him. I mean, Chet, the running joke between him and me is who's been here longer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you and Jack Ham have been doing the game since 2000, uh -huh. 22 years together now, so congrats to you guys. Uh, let's turn to the running backs. Noah Kane now at LSU, so we have, uh, let's see, Kevon Lee plus holdover Devin Ford and a couple of freshmen who are getting a lot of buzz, Nick Singleton and Katron Allen. I believe Lee is going to be the primary guy, but tell us about this group. This is, I think, the difference maker in what Penn State can do. If they can do what I think they can do, it's going to really change a lot of things for Penn State. Lee's a good, solid running back. Ford really helps you in the pass game. But Singleton and Allen, at least to this point, Singleton and Allen as practice players have shown that they have the ability to be difference makers, that Singleton can take it to the house from anywhere. That Allen has now, and Allen's the guy that a lot of people aren't talking about, but they should be talking about. He has power speed hits the hole and part of this ability to hit the hole guys is that it's not just hitting the hole but it's getting to the second level and these two guys can break tackles and i felt that was an area last year where penn state's running backs did not do a great job they weren't they didn't do a great job of breaking tackles at the second level which prevented them from getting bigger plays this group i think can do that and i think they're going to have the holes to operate with you know i'm not going to go on too much about the offensive line do I think they're improved? Yes. But, of course, you know, let's face it. We've talked about that before. Let's all see it play out in practicality and maybe in a month we'll have a better evaluation. But I think they got a chance. <laughs> and that, that was exactly what I was going to ask you about was the offensive line. I'm no offensive line guy myself. 
uh, you know, so it's always there first for me. Um, well, offensive linemen are really smart, Bill, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear you. Well, you know, it seems like over not just last year, but over the last handful of years, they've had a couple individual guys that turned out being pretty good and ended up playing pro ball. Uh, but as a group, they've never seemed to have brought it back together for actually quite a long time now. Yeah, and years ago, I was, you know, I had done a lot of research about, you know, what it's like with sanctions when you get cut down on scholarships. And it came back to the same thing over and over again. The area of the team that takes the longest to rebuild is the offensive line. And USC was a good example of that, too, because they were at 75 scholarships for years. But now, of course, they've been out of that for a while. And so to your point, is now they've got to get to the point where guys, where they're developing, and I think they've got eight guys that can play now. And I don't think I've been able to say that in a while. And I look at Scruggs. Now, Scruggs is an NFL player. There's no getting around it. Wormley was going to be the starting left guard last year, Bill. He gets injured in the last scrimmage before the season. That was a big loss right there. Getting him back has been really important. Now, they flipped him over to right guard, okay? Tangwall is a really good player. And now you add in Norzak. And Norzak transferred in from Cornell. And they've done a really good job, Bill, of vetting transfers. This guy is not only smart, he's from Cornell, so I don't want to interview him. And, <laughs> and, but he's powerful and has good technique. He's going to play a lot. And we'll take it on a week-by-week -week basis to see if it all comes together. Last year's wide receiver go-to guy, of course, Jahan Dotson in the NFL now. Uh, who do we have as pass catchers this year? Is it Mitch Tinsley, Parker Washington, those are guys? Mitch Tinsley, Parker Washington, Keandre Lambert-Smith. Uh, then you add in Malik Mega, big kid who can fly. Uh, and then Harrison Wallace. That's another name you should be watching for as well. Uh, Harrison Wallace. I mean, those five guys to me are the five prime guys. You know, you look at Lambert Smith, Wallace, Megan, they can kind of take the top off. Parker Washington and, and Tinsley are ultra reliable, but in a lot of ways they're the same guy, but they'll both be out there at the same time. Plus, you've got to add in the tight ends. The tight ends, all three veterans, Theo Johnson, Bretton Strange, Tyler Warren. It's not a question of catching the ball. Last year when they beat Auburn, they, the three of them combined for six catches for 130 yards, and they were huge factors in winning the game. But remember, too, they're the H-back. So they've got to also, at the same time, being a part of the pass game. Those three guys are going to be critical as really blockers in this running game that we just talked about. Well, let's jump over to the defensive side, and I, I guess the best player of that group uh, is probably Joey Porter. I, I read an article said that he's as good a corner as been at Penn State in many, many years. That's uh, that's big shoes. Length, speed, and good cover skills. Uh, I think that really defines them. I mean, you want to have big corners in today's game. Uh, if you can get a corner at six one, six two, like Joey Porter has the length that he has. Uh, even if you're beaten by a step and you've got length, you can still make up for it because you can cover that kind of ground just in pure, you know, with your arms. Jair Brown led the nation in interceptions last year at safety. Having him back to quarterback that secondary is really important. And you can't put a price on what P.J. Mustafer coming back means. It doesn't mean that Mustafer is going to play 70 plays in a game. Because they've got depth of tackle, which really helps. But the, he has a presence about him. You know, he's, he's a big-time player that can be a first-team All-Big Ten selection. But also his presence and his leadership mean a lot. We'll keep an eye on the linebackers, too, including Curtis yeah. Jacobs. But i got to ask you about the head coach. Uh, even though James Franklin's uh, record – Against Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan State, a combined seven and seventeen. He's two and thirteen against top ten teams. Not great, but then last November he got that big ten-year, seventy-five million dollar contract extension. Is he under more pressure than ever this year? Do you think? Uh, not with Pat Kraft. No. Uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, I mean, Pat and he are on the same page. The athletic director. So that's that. That's no issue. Look, the ten-year deal. Let's be honest about it. 
what are Penn State fans used to? Penn State fans are using, used to having coaches here for a long time, and there's a stability to it that when he goes out to recruit, they're always going to ask if the cloud is, I mean, is hanging over you. How do you I, if you're Scott Frost, how are you going to recruit? I mean, yeah. How are you going to recruit? Because every parent and every player is going to say, well, are you going to be there next year? Right. Well, now with a 10-year deal, he's got that comfort level in recruiting saying, hey, look, I'm your coach. Right? You're going to come here. This is what you're going to get. It's about the stability of the position because the programs that really struggle are the ones that look around and say, doggone, um, we need to change. Okay, now look, and sometimes you have to change. There's no question sometimes you have to change. You know? And Brian Kelly, for example, is at Notre Dame for a long time. They weren't going to change, but he left on his own. Well, now you got a guy that you got locked in for 10 years and you feel comfortable about what you're going to get and how you're going to be able to recruit. But you have to also make it pay off. He knows he's got to get back to being the 42 wins over four years that we talked about in 16, 17, 18, and 19. And a lot of that is internal pressure. Now you're always going to have, for some reason, there seems to be a lot of pressure on Twitter. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, but, you know, Shocking. For some odd reason. I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but that's for, you know, but I want my fan base to be passionate. I don't want my fan base to be ap- apathetic. If you have an apathetic fan base, you got a problem. Hey, Steve, you mentioned Manny Diaz. Uh, he comes up from Miami. He fired yeah. as the head coach there. Quality defensive coordinator up to that point. Things didn't yeah. go too well with the Hurricanes. Uh, are you expecting any much different uh, scheme type things from Manny on defense? Bill, there's a lot of elements that Manny Diaz has in there that Brent Pride had. Because what Brent Pride did worked. But at the same time, there's certain ways Manny wants to play. And Manny is big on attack, attack, and when you're done attacking, attack again. And the bottom line is he just wants to get takeaways as often as possible. He's got the personnel to play the multiple sub packages I'm talking about. And also it really helps getting Adisa Isaac back, getting Chop Robinson to go with Nick Tarburton, okay? To bring in, you know, I mean, man over and deny Dennis Sutton. You want more pressure from those guys, and don't discount a team beam at a defensive tackle. That's a real speed guy that you've got playing right there in the middle that could be hard to handle. I love a defensive end named Chop. That's just cool. <laughs> you, you know, you know how you know why he's called Chop? No, he was a fourteen pound baby, and oh. when he was so when he was when he was born. His father started calling him pork chop. <laughs> so finally it got to the point where he says, well, I don't want to be known as pork chop. So <laughs> now it's just chop. Which is better than just pork, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah, I don't think I want to be known. You know, I don't want to be known as that. No. All right. Last thing from me. Um, the lines are not in the top 25. That's rare. We don't like that. But we saw what Kirk Herbstreet had to say recently. Penn State, a sleeper pick. What is your honest outlook, Steve? What should we expect this year? Look, do I think they're a good team? I do. Uh, do I care they're in the top 25 at this hour? No. To me, you go out and you can prove it every single week. Last year, I believe it was, what, eight of the top 10 teams in the first two and a half, two, three weeks of the season lost and fell out. Mm-hmm. So you let it, you just, you just let it, everything happen organically. You know, by the end of the month, be ranked. And then the key is where are you rank when the college football playoff poll comes out? at the end of the month of October. Right. That's when it really becomes important. So I don't worry about the rankings. That's good for TV ratings. You'll have an opportunity to prove it by playing at Purdue. You'll have an opportunity to prove it by playing at Auburn. You'll have an opportunity to prove it by playing at Michigan. Right. You'll have an opportunity to prove it when you play Ohio State, Minnesota. So you can go on and on Northwestern here. You'll have plenty of opportunities to prove about where you really belong. So I don't really care where you start. Steve, one final question for me. Looking forward, uh, USC and UCLA are going to join the Big Ten. Uh, good thing, bad thing. For me, for me personally, I, I'm an old traditionalist. I want to see that Rose Bowl Big Ten Pac, Pac-10 game, but it's gone. I'll be honest, Bill. I loved it. I mean, when they expanded the other times, you know, Nebraska, Maryland, Rutgers, I was like, okay, you know, maybe I'll – my first thought on Maryland Rutgers was, well, for basketball, I can drive. 
Right, you know, I mean, that, sir, you know, it was good to have an Eastern component. That's fine. This one genuinely excited me because to me, this is, this is, if you're going to expand, you want to hit a grand slam. When Penn State came in, they hit a grand slam. I mean, look at the TV ratings. The number one rated school last year in terms of average TV rating was Ohio State. Number two was Michigan. Three was Alabama and Penn State was four. So you can't put a price on three of the top four brands because Penn State averaged 3.9 million viewers a game last year, fourth in the country. Penn State had six of the 41 games of 4 million viewers or more. USC brings that kind of cachet in to the conference when now you've got four mega brands like that all in the same conference. You've got the LA market. UCLA adds in an important secondary brand to go with Wisconsin, Iowa, Nebraska. I mean, despite Nebraska's record, they draw fans, okay? And they've got a great fan base. And Michigan State. So now you get five primary secondary brands with four primary brands. And that's why the TV package is the way it is. You're getting $8 billion <laughs> over seven years out of your TV package because now you've got New York. And look, Penn State brought in New York anyway. Okay, but you can't technically claim it unless you have a school in the footprint. Well, Rutgers does that. Okay, <laughs> right. And then, of course, the D.C. area and Baltimore with Maryland. Then you have Philly, the fifth largest market in the country. Then you got Pittsburgh. You got Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Chicago, Milwaukee. Madison's not bad. Okay, Minneapolis. Okay, Des Moines, Lincoln, right? Now you add in Los Angeles. So you have four of the top five markets in the country in your footprint. And I, let's face it, when USC comes to Penn State, how juiced are the fans going to be? When UCLA comes to Penn State, in football or basketball, how juiced are the fans going to be? Yeah. Right? Fans want to see big games. They love games with stakes. They bring cachet. And how excited are the fans in California going to be to have Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State come out to play in the Rose Bowl or the Coliseum? Right? To see Michigan State in basketball play at Pauley. Right? To see Illinois go out there and play at Galen. I already know the arenas. We're good. So, I mean, I mean to me, that's the kind of grand slam you're trying to hit. Now, there are other things people talk about that don't excite me. This one did. I'm hoping we get to see lots of push-ups from this guy this year. There you go. Beautiful. <laughs> he looks like he's in shape. He's good shape, yeah. 